when with Christ we stand in glory. That doesn't, that doesn't have to wait. Yes, the ultimate fulfillment will be when he comes back. But we can stand with him now in his glory. How many of you watched the news this week? Are you a Christian? Are you willing to say yes when there's a gun to your head? Think about that. If you said no, you could live. If you said yes, you're dead. See, it isn't about gun control. It's just my little rant for a minute. It's about the persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. And it's only going to get worse, so you've got to consider this. Are you in or are you out? If you couldn't say yes in that moment, you've got some work to do. Amen? You may be seated. I've got a couple more rants, and then, I'll, then we'll do some announcements. And I believe that these are Holy Ghost rants, by the way. Um, this last week has been an absolute whirlwind, spiritually. I have just been... We went to the MMFI conference and, and got ministered to by, by, by apostles and prophets. I mean, Prophet Bill Hammond, um, I'll tell you what, he was encouraging and challenging. How many of you have ever... Now, let me do it this way. I'll tell you a little story. Back... Oh my goodness, now it's been 25 years ago. I was a meat manager in a grocery store. I had employees working for me. And I got called into the office, the supervisor was in town. I got called into the office to meet with my supervisor, and he reprimanded me with a write up. The write up was because I didn't make my employees do what was expected of them. How many of you have ever been in middle management? Is there any worse place to be than middle management? I would rather be a dishwasher than a manager. Dishwasher, just do what you're told, no worries, no concerns. Well, I discovered something. I'm still in middle management. I'm the lead pastor here, but I have a boss. His name is God. And now I'm accountable to my pastor. I'm accountable to the elders, so I'm not saying I'm not accountable. We're all accountable to another human being as well. If you're not, you're missing the mark. But ultimately, God is my boss. He's my father, and he spanked me this week. Don't you love it when you get spankings from your father? I should love it, and so should you, because he chastens those who he loves. But my spanking is going to lead to spanking of some of you all. Because I got written up for not doing the part of the job that I don't like to do. Let me read to you what Paul told Timothy he needed to do. This is at the end of Paul's life, one of his last admonishments to his spiritual son in 2 Timothy 4. He tells, he tells Timothy, I charge you, this is verse 1 and 2, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. That's quite a, that's quite a statement in itself, isn't it? You got, you got Paul the Apostle saying, I charge you before God and Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead. That's got some weight behind it. Then he tells Timothy, who was, a, was an apostolic pastor, whatever you want to call him, he said, preach the word. I think I'm preaching the word. I haven't watered down the message. Uh, I'm preaching the word. If you're not getting it, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You've got to change your station. Be ready, in season and out of season. I think I do okay with that. I, I would be there in a heartbeat. Anytime God calls, I'm there. If you call, hopefully I'm there. But then it says, convince. I'd much rather um, influence you by, by persuasion than any other way. So convincing, I can live with that. But then it goes on to say, rebuke. I'm not too good at that. Some of you should have been rebuked by now by me, and you haven't been. And because of that, you're not where you could be. Now, yes, you still are making the decisions, but when, when God puts a person in your life as your overseer, that overseer has a responsibility to do everything that that overseer can do to further you into your destiny and your calling. And if that person fails that job, then you don't, then you don't have the rub, the iron sharpening iron, and you don't have the opportunity to face the things you don't want to face. Now, 
probably at least 50% of the time when somebody tries to rebuke somebody in the spirit, they cut and run and leave and they never see them again. I was just talking with a pastor friend this week at the conference and he said um, a mutual, we had a mutual meeting with somebody that, um, that was tense and it was one of those times of, you know, Pastor Mary and I had to swallow hard and forgive and say it's okay. But this, this other pastor was coming alongside this person and said, you know, after this meeting, this meeting went well and there's some things that God has exposed in your heart, we should get together on a weekly basis for a season and work on these things. That person never came to church again, to that church, and never even spoke to that man again. It's been two years. Pretty hard to rebuke somebody and help them if they cut and run. So if I rebuke you, please don't cut and run because I'm not doing it for my own good. I don't want to do these things. I just want everybody to like me. Don't you all want everybody to like you? Who said no? You don't want everybody to like you? You don't want everybody to not like you. Okay. So it says rebuke, exhort. I think I'm pretty good with exhorting. That's a spiritual gift I have. You know, exhortation is a strong encouragement with a, with a push to do something in action. So I hope every time you come here, you feel exhorted. Yes, you're encouraged, but there's an action that should be happening. And then, of course, with all long suffering and teaching. So pray for your pastor that your pastor does the hard jobs, the things that I don't like to do, um, are the things that I need to do. And when I come to see you and talk with you and bring something into the light, um, don't cut and run, please. I mean, if you do, it's going to hurt me and it's going to hurt you. And Brad Keller said the other day, when you resist the process, all you do is lengthen it. So you can cut and run, but it ain't going to go away. You're just going to go around the mountain and waste time. So that's my first little exhortation to y'all. One of the other things that God spoke to me at the conference was, very, very clearly and plainly that I and you are catalysts. But we're catalysts with a cause. We are part of the third reformation of the church. When when, When I stopped and realized that how much has changed in the last 30, 40 years in the church, but it's only for one reason. Everything that's happened up until now is only for one reason. And that is for the saints' ministry to come. And that's who? That's y'all. That's us all. And that is not the way the church thinks. This is a paradigm shift. It's huge. The church thinks you go to church. No, you don't go to church. You are the church. And one of the reasons that's happened is the word church is not a good translation. It's actually not even an English word. It's a German word that was replaced by Martin Luther. Because I don't know why that happened. But the, the Greek word for church, ecclesia, means the called out ones. And the called out ones were the governing body of the, of the community. That means a whole lot different thing than church to me and, and the American mindset. How can, and here's a question for you. How can you be part of the governing community if you're not part of the governing community? David Platt said on the radio the other day, maybe, I'm, maybe this is my message, I don't know. David Platt said on the radio on the way home from the revival meetings the other day something very profound, and it's just resonated with me, and I think it's something similar to what I said last week and the week before and the week before, and that is, he said, he said it this way, if you're apart from the church, you're apart from Christ. You might be able to wander around out there for a little while, but if you're apart from the church, you're in danger. And I got a revelation at the revival meetings. You know, it's one of those things, you're just sitting there and you're looking around and all of a sudden, boing. Anybody ever have those? I got this revelation. Those that choose not to be involved in a local church are prideful. The reason they're not in church is pride. Because their feeling is the church is not good enough for them. They're too good for the church. The church isn't going to meet their needs. The church is this and the church is that. I'm better than that. No, you're not. Maybe you get your butt in church, in our meeting. Maybe God would use you to further the church and change the church and make the church better. So, anyhow, I'm preaching now, ain't I? So the other things that he showed me was, um, I'm a reformer. That means we should expect pushback. Reformers got pushback. Reformers were burned at the stake and crucified and killed and stoned. 
When you're trying to follow God and bring reformation to the church, religious people don't like it, the devil don't like it, and the world doesn't like it. Number two, uh, this is for me. I can't share with you everything he said to me because some of it's just for me, but these three things I think I can. I need to activate and release more in spiritual aspect of ministry. And it's really interesting. I got that word at the conference, and then one night at the, whatever night it was, Thursday night at the seven days thing, I just minded my own business. I wasn't, wasn't on the prayer ministry team, just minding my own business. And I went up to stand behind Bishop just to be there with him to protect him, if you would, because he was being, to just kind of, you know, keep an eye on him and encourage him and be there with him. And all of a sudden I get pulled over here to pray for this guy. And you know how long it's been? This is, uh, I'm just, the word for this year is authentic, right? So I'm going to be an authentic, real. It's been way too long since I've operated in spiritual gifts. So I'm standing in front of this guy feeling like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And God gave me a word of knowledge that was so crystal clear. The man broke. It was so powerful. I led him to Christ. But the word of knowledge is what cut it. I mean, one of the most accurate words I've ever... I mean, it's like, wow. So I, I ask for your forgiveness for not being in that aspect of ministry, not doing all that I'm supposed to be doing. Because you need to know that your pastor is trying to hear from God, and sometimes he's going to give me a word for you. You shouldn't have to go to find somebody out there to give you a word. God might use somebody out there, that's wonderful and that's okay, but you should be getting a word here. And thirdly, and, and this is not a new revelation, but it's a time thing. We need more prayer. I need to pray more. We need to pray more. Starting a week from Wednesday, every Wednesday night, we're going to have a meeting here. It'll be downstairs, starting at 7 o'clock and ending at 8.30. And um, we believe that uh, God has given us a blueprint for this. Right, Mr. Edson? Actually, as Scott was explaining it to me, it was like the ark. Do this, 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 and this. So we're going to meet at 7 o'clock downstairs. You can have coffee. You can sit around the tables. and It's going to be a relaxed, chill atmosphere, you know, dude. And for the first 15, 20, 30 minutes, somebody, somebody one of you, will be bringing a teaching or an encouragement or a, whatever it is. Because one of the things that I know is that there are people in this body that have a gift, an ability, a, a gift from God to be able to teach, preach, etc., etc. And I'm up here, so where do you have an outlet for it? So hopefully this will be an encouragement to those that have that gift. And I also know that God wants to speak through us all to us all. And then we're going to break into a time of prayer that will have some structure to it, but we're not going to put God in a box. Okay? We need more prayer. Prayer is going to be the fuel that, that takes us to the next level. Speaking of the next level, I don't know if I'm going to have time to preach after I get done all this. Speaking of the next level... This is not your fault, or maybe some of it's your fault, but I'll take some, some blame for it, okay? There are people in this building right now, and maybe it's you, who have missed it, have not stepped up, and because of that, there are people who are not in Christ. I have a big vision. I haven't been released to share this vision yet, and I'm not concerned about the finances. You know what's really interesting? I'm not concerned about the finances. I'm not concerned about any of those things. The, all of the other pieces, I'm not concerned about at all. The thing that burdens me is... Where are the people that are willing to step up, grow up, step up, and do what God is calling them to do? Are you willing? I mean, there's a cost. But there's nothing like the joy of the Lord when you're obedient. It's worth whatever the price is. So as we go forward, I'm going to challenge you all. There's some of you that there's character issues. The character issues that have kept you from becoming the person that God has called you to be. The position, the role, the, the ministry is waiting for you to get your character issues in order. Whew. 
I don't know if I'm going to get to my message, Dominic. It might have to wait. Last night, we had the privilege of, of having dinner with, with uh, Papa Vince and, and Ruth, and he shared his story. The story of how he came to Vermont. And it reminds me of the story I told last week about the dairy farmer. So here's Vince. He's a young man, comes to America, can't speak English, ends up getting divorced, so the Catholic Church kicks him out, can't go to church. And back in the day, he said he had quite a temper, so the priest, he got an earful. So here this guy is, he can't go to church, he's, he's a little resentful and bitter towards the church, he's divorced, he's a nobody, he has no education, he can't even speak the language. Make a long story short, he ends up giving his life to Christ, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit, and six years after he gets saved, he's pastoring a church. How does that happen? And then, thankfully, he was in a meeting and he heard God speak and he said, I want you to go to Vermont. He's in Florida, pastoring a church in Florida, and God sent him to Vermont. And he started a little church up in Morrisville. And out of that little church in Morrisville, God, God planted him there and then sent him to Burlington, planted Maranatha Christian Church. And out of that, wow. Wow. Out of that, there have been untold thousands of people that have been affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ because one man who, knew no, who couldn't even speak English, who was uneducated, all of this stuff, he just said yes to God. And he said very plainly last night, he said, all I did was do my best to listen and do what he asked me to do. That's the same exact words that that dairy farmer said. Some of those things that he asked him to do, I'm sure, were not easy. He said it was back in the hippie days. I was never a hippie, so I can't really relate. I was a redneck, not a hippie. But he said these hippies started coming to church. Next thing you know, he's got 10, 12, 15, 20 of them at his house. And they didn't know how to dress, and they had long hair, and they didn't smell good. God told him to love them. Love them. And out of that began this revival in Vermont that is actually still going on because one man said yes. You know, before he came here, I, I know a guy named Everett Schoberg who has passed on now. He actually married us, had a doctorate in theology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He came here, came to Vermont in the 1950s, and he said he could not find a Bible-believing church. He said the Baptists were so liberal the Methodists wouldn't have anything to do with them. That's pretty scary. But look what God has done since. What does God want to do in the future, and who does he want to use? Does he want to use the best and the brightest? Yeah, but he also wants to use you, especially you who don't think you have what it takes. Because somehow, this is, this, this is part of the message, his power is activated through your weakness. Humility and weakness is the exact opposite of pride, and he said he resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So are you ready for this next revival, this great awakening that I believe God wants to do in this region? There's going to be a price to pay. It's going to cost you. Now, is it going to cost you money? It might cost you money, but it is going to cost you time. It might, may cost you your reputation because all of a sudden people find out you're one of those. Are you willing to pay the price? And I make a statement today. You have my word that I will do all I can, even the hard things, even the rebuke, to do all I can to help you get where God has called you to be. Is that fair?